We're going to continue with the second chapter of Wise Child by Monica Furlong of the White House. Wise Child has been exploring Juniper's gigantic house that is so high up on the cliff and overlooks the sea. And this description from the last the beginning of this chapter, when I was a kid and this was being read to me, really got into my head and I had dreams about being in this house and the things that I would discover there. And Wise Child is going to discover some very interesting things in this house. I don't remember if it happens in this chapter or not. We're reading this book. For me, it's probably the first time in more than 20 years that I've read this book again, so I'm discovering things that I had forgotten about, but I'm still really enjoying it, and I hope that you are too. I knew a spell, I told Juniper, when my hunger was somewhat appeased. I didn't want her to think she was the only one who knew magic. Well, it's more of a charm, really, for a toothache. Nayal taught it to me. That boy with the sad eyes who lives in the house opposite the church. I was to be astonished how carefully Juniper had observed us all. I'll tell you if you like. I could never resist any chance to recite. So I plunged into the charm. Peter sat weeping on a marble stone. Jesus came and said, What aileth thee, Peter? He answered and said, My Lord and my God. He could... He that can say this and believe it for my sake, never more shall have the toothache. I finished this with a fine dramatic flourish. Well, said Juniper, does it work? I'm not sure, I said truthfully. I only have had toothache once, and I had, had a feeling it was about to get better anyway. Toothache is a difficult one, Juniper admitted, as one magician to another. I expect I'd have some other ideas if I racked my brains. Chamomile might help a bit. Now I must go and shut up the chickens. There's a wicked old fox on the prowl, and perhaps you could wash the plates. I did not want to admit that I was the only girl in those parts who had never washed plates, that I had always left it all to my grandmother. So, although I hated doing these sort of jobs, I lifted the big water jug that stood in the sink near the table and poured some water into a bowl. I used a kind of scratchy twig thing to take the stickiness off the plates. Luckily, they were not very dirty. Then I found the cloth and dried them. Although a little of the stickiness came off on the cloth and made it dirty, I more or less got it done. Juniper, meanwhile, had come back bearing an armful of driftwood, and quite soon the salty flames began twisting green and blue around the wood. It was lovely to watch. Would you like me to tell you a story? Juniper asked. I'm a good storyteller. I said nothing feeling that the distance between us had become much too narrow over supper. I had even told her what I knew about the stars, how my father used to take me out at night and hold me on his shoulder and teach me the names of the planets, and how in the summer sometimes we would lie out at night on a hill with a blanket or two and watch the great constellations wheel about us. I would fall asleep and wake up and find that Orion, my favourite, and moved toward the horizon, and that the other stars were looking down on me. Suddenly I wanted to finbar, finbar very badly, as if Juniper could read my mind, she said very quietly, You will be back, wise child, in a while. Meanwhile, you will have to make do with me. Without further speech, she picked up the lute, tuned it, and began to sing me a song about three knights. One wore red, one more green, and one wore yellow. The chorus went... Oh, the red, the green, and the yellow. There was also a bit that went, The harp, the lute, the pipe, the flute, The cymbal sweet, It is the tr sweet, is the treble, violin. It all made such an impression on me that I still catch myself singing it from time to time. Although Juniper never sang it again after that night, all three of the knights went on a quest. But only the yellow knight was lucky in one lady, probably because he was the nicest of them all. I liked it very much. Then Juniper told me a story about a juggler who got cleverer and cleverer and cleverer and learned to juggle with more and more balls, and got more and more conceited with each ball he took on, until one day he juggled in front of the emperor and dropped the whole lot. It was really very funny seeing how conceited the juggler was, from looking at the proud expression on Juniper's face, and then how crestfallen he was after the catastrophe. 
But she went on to explain how the kitchen maid, who had always loved him and whom he had thought beneath him, came and comforted him for the first time. He, tr he truly appreciated her and realized he loved her. I can teach you to juggle if you like, Juniper said. Not as many balls as the juggler in the story, three or four perhaps. She had some wormy apples in a basket, windfalls that had come before the crop was right, and she showed me what to do. The trick, she said, is getting the rhythm right. Da-da, 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 like that. You throw the apple up with your left hand, and just as it is coming to the top of its flight, you throw the next apple right to left. Even with this advice, I couldn't do it. I kept dropping the apples and giggling and trying again. Juniper wasn't very good at it either. Though she was better than I was, I forgot all about her being a witch and was laughing and bouncing apples off the furniture until suddenly one fell on the cards. Immediately, Juniper stopped laughing and became very serious indeed. You've changed the cards, she said. I knew she was going to be angry with me now and I hung my head. I'm sorry. They were there and I played with them, I said. I think I would have lied if I thought I could get away with it. Oh, that doesn't matter, Juniper said. It's just what you have done to the cards that I am interested in. I was just playing around, I said wretchedly. Playing is what people do with ca those cards. Then you look at the pattern and see what it tells you. It doesn't tell me anything, I said, looking doubtfully at the jumble of cards. It tells me something, though. What? That this is the right place for you. I thought it was. It was growing dark now, and Juniper took a long taper from the shelf over the hearth, touched it to the fire, and lit a small candlestick also standing on the shelf. As she straightened herself from this task and handed me the candle, she suddenly looked strange in the firelight, unnaturally tall and a little fierce. At the same time, I was aware of the darkness waiting for me at the top of the stairs. I turned away from her, ashamed to tell her that a big girl like me was frightened of the dark, and still more frightened of whatever it was she might have hidden in her dark cabinet. I wanted Aunt Morag and the children in the village, and all the things and people that I was used to. My feet moved very slowly up the staircase, and the shadow of the candle danced mockingly on the wall. My hand slid around the doorknob of the big room on the right, and I slipped through the door, feeling very tiny in the vastness of the room. I put the candle down beside the bed, took off my smock and dropped it on the floor. I thought I had better not walk too close to the bed, lest a hand should come out and grab my ankle. So I took a running jump at the bed, which gave a little squeal as I landed on it. I pulled the blankets and sheets close. If I had not been so scared, I would have admired the fineness of the sheets. But my attention was on the way the candlelight flickered over the walls and up and down into the high, high ceiling. Over one cabinet was a big, dark hole. And straining my eyes into the shadow, I could see a face with a blunt nose and a big chin looking out of it. Perhaps if I blew out my candle, it would think I had gone away. I knew that magic creatures were easily deceived. I, I half sat up and blew out the candle, and then with a little moan, lay back and pulled the sheets and blankets over my head. Now, however, the darkness seemed sort of creaky, and I thought I could hear breathing. When I put my head to the pillow, I could hear a steady thump 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 and i imagined a monster walking up and down the passage outside my door he had a body like a man but a head like a pig it was worse with the candle out than it was than it had been with it alight the darkness felt heavy and stuffy as if it was pressing the breath out of me i began to cry with tiny sobs at first then with big noisy ones just then the door opened and juniper came in carrying a lamp which she held up high why, wise child, she said. She came and sat down on the bed, and suddenly the room seemed more cheerful as she filled it with her warm presence. What is it? I thought of all the things that had scared me. I'm frightened, I wailed. What of? asked Juniper, who I was later to discover always liked to know the details of things. Without stopping to think, as if I was talking to some other person altogether, I told Juniper between sobs how my cousins had said that her cabinets were full of ghosts or bodies, or and about how she flew on her broomstick, and about the jewel cave, and about the honey drink that made you see everything differently. I heaved a great sobbing sigh when I got to the end, and I felt a lot better. She had listened carefully to all of it. That would be enough to frighten anyone, she said warmly. 
I think you have been very brave with all that to worry about. As for the cabinets, they are full of very boring things, you know. We'll look at them by daylight and you can see for yourself. For the rest, there are things about the way I live that are different from the life you are used to, but I think you will rather like it when you get used to it. You mean there isn't any magic or spells or anything of that sort? I said immediately, disappointed now that my fear had subsided. I didn't say that. It's just that magic gets quite ordinary when you live with it, you know. You'll soon see. There was silence between us for a little. For a little. And then she said, You know, this room is much too big for you, wise child. You will rattle around in it like a hailstone on, like a hailstone on a roof. In my bedroom, there is a tiny room with a bed in it. Just the right size for you. And now that you know that there is no need to be frightened of me, it will be just right for you. Would you like to sleep in there? I nodded. It sounded lovely. Juniper wrapped a quilt around me, lifted me up in her arms, as she had done those years before on the road, and carried me out of the frightening room, across the passage, into the little bed in the tiny room with the orange flowers. She tucked the bedclothes around me. Suddenly I felt wonderfully warm and cosy and terribly sleepy. Whatever the horrors of the house, they seemed to have nothing to do with me now. Later I half woke to hear Juniper quietly breathing in her part of the room. She wasn't out on her broomstick then, and that made me feel glad and safe. When I w next woke up, the sunshine was brilliant on the orange flowers. The sky was blue, and I could hear birds singing. I jumped out of bed onto the bright rag rug, pulled on my brown smock. There was no sign of the black dress, and I was not sorry, and ran barefoot down the stairs, curious to see what Juniper would do or say today. And that is the end of chapter two.